Today we got some more actual history about Henry Plummer's gang of robbers who preyed on miners in the mining towns of Oregon, Idaho, and Montana in the early 1860s. We'll be reading from this book, Vigilante Days and Ways, published all the way back in 1890 by Nathaniel Pitt Langford. Today we'll focus on a new candidate for bloody laurels, Charlie Harper. Unfortunately, there aren't pictures of many of these outlaws other than Plummer, but in today's episode, some of the men listed here in Plummer's gang are going to get their first taste of vigilante justice. A new candidate for Bloody Laurels now appears in the person of Charlie Harper. He arrived in Walla Walla in the fall of 1861. A young man of 25, of medium size, of erect carriage, clear florid complexion, and profuse auburn hair. He could, but for the leer in his small, inexpressive gray eyes, have passed in any society for a gentleman. His previous life is a sealed book, but the readiness with which he engaged in crime showed that he was not without experience. He told his landlord that he had no money, but that partners were coming who would relieve his necessities. The second night after his arrival, several hundred dollars of gold coin was stolen from a lodger who occupied the room adjoining his. He exhibited eagles by the handful while intoxicated the next day, which he said were borrowed from an acquaintance. No one doubted that he had stolen them, but where officers were believed to wink at crime, prosecution was useless. Charlie was not even arrested upon suspicion. The money he had obtained introduced him to the Society of the Roughs, with whom he became so popular that he aspired to be their leader. This honor was disputed by Ridgely, whom we left wounded in the last chapter, and by Cherokee Bob, both of whom claimed precedence from longer residence and greater familiarity with the opportunities for distinction. Circumstances soon occurred which enabled Charlie, without disputation, to assume the role of the chief of the Walla Walla Desperados. Cherokee Bob, heretofore mentioned as an associate of Plummer at Lewiston, was an uneducated Southerner. His mother was a half-blood Cherokee, hence his name. With a hatred of the North and the Northern soldiery born of prejudice and ignorance, and a constitutional faith in the superior prowess of the Southern people, and with mercurial passions inflamed by the contest that was still raging, this ruffian was nearly a maniac in his adherence to the cause of secession. He could talk or think of little else than the great inferiority of the northern to the southern soldiers, and was continually boasting of his own superior physical power. He would often taunt the soldiers of the garrison near Walla Walla. In ingenuity of vaunting expression, he far excelled Captain Bobadell himself. But like that hero of dramatic fiction, he was destined to experience a reverse more humiliating, if possible, than that of his great prototype. With shotgun in hand and revolver in his belt, it was his frequent boast that he could take a black man along with him, carrying two baskets loaded with pistols, and put to flight the bravest regiment of the Federal Army. No person who has witnessed a theatrical performance in a mining camp can forget the general din and noise with which the audience fill up the intervals between the acts, whistling, singing, hooting, yelling, and a general shuffling of feet, and moving about are so invariable as to form, in fact, a feature of the performance, so long as they are unaccompanied by quarrelsome demonstrations and do not become too boisterous, efforts are seldom made to suppress them. The boys are permitted to have a good time in their own way, and the lookers-on accustomed to the scene are often compensated for any annoyance that may be occasioned by strokes of border humor more enjoyable than the play itself. Cherokee Bob, eager for an opportunity when he could wreak his demoniac wrath upon some of the federal soldiers, with the aid and complicity of Deputy Sheriff Porter, who like himself was a secessionist, contrived the following plan as favorable to his purpose. It was agreed between them that on a certain evening Bob and his friends should attend the theater fully armed. Porter, under the pretext of quelling disturbances between the acts, should by his insulting language and manner provoke an affray with the soldiers present, in the progress of which he would command Bob and those with him to assist, and thus, under the seeming protection of the law, save them from the consequences of any acts of vengeance they desired to commit. 
On the evening appointed, six or seven soldiers were seated side by side in the pits, a single one occupying a seat in the gallery behind them. Porter was near them, and Bob and his associates in a position convenient to him. When the curtain fell upon the first act, the usual noises commenced, the soldiers joining in making them. Porter sprang from his seat and striding in front of them vociferated, Dry up there, you brass-mounted hirelings, or I'll snatch you bald-headed. This insulting language produced the desired effect. Smarting under the implied reproach it conveyed, one of the soldiers sharply inquired, Why do you single us out when there are others more boisterous? Porter waited for no further provocation, but drawing and cocking his revolver with one hand and seizing the soldier nearest to him with the other, he dragged him ignominiously into the circle where he was standing, ordering the deputy city marshal and Bob and his friends to assist in arresting him. The soldiers offered resistance. An immediate melee was the consequence. The women and children in the audience screamed in affright. The other soldiers present rushed with drawn pistols to the rescue of their comrade. The one in the gallery sprang upon one of the officers with the ferocity of a wild beast. Cherokee Bob, with a pistol in one hand and a bowie knife in the other, his voice wildly ringing above all other sounds, was in his true element. More than a dozen pistol shots followed in quick succession. Two of the soldiers were killed, and others fearfully mangled. Porter and his deputy assistant were each shot through a leg, the latter crippled for life. The work of blood was progressing, and but for the interference of an officer of the garrison, would have ended only with the death of the assassins. The next day the soldiers appealed to their commanding officer for redress. He ordered those of them engaged in the affray to be placed under arrest, and dismissed the subject from his thoughts. Indignant at this unexpected treatment, about fifty of the soldiers armed themselves and marched into town with the determination to capture and hang Cherokee Bob, whom they knew to be the chief mover of the murderous assault. Disavowing all riotous intentions, they informed the citizens of their design, and commenced a thorough search for the murderer. He, meanwhile, fearful of their revenge, eluded them by leaving the town before the dawn of morning, on a stolen horse for Lewiston. The year before his appearance in Walla Walla, Ridgely was living in Sacramento. During his sojourn there, he acquired notoriety for his thievish and villainous propensities. One of the police corps, detecting him in the commission of a larceny, arrested him. He was convicted and sentenced to imprisonment in the county jail. He vowed revenge against Gilchrist the policeman, but on his release fled to the gold mines. Soon after his arrival at Walla Walla, he fell in with his old enemy and secretly renewed the determination to take his life. Calling upon a friend to accompany him, he boldly entered a saloon where he knew Gilchrist to be and fired several shots at him. Gilchrist fell at the first fire. Ridgely, believing he had killed him, left the saloon, saying as he went, I have thrown a load off my mind and now feel easy. Gilchrist was badly wounded but recovered. Ridgely, escaping arrest on the night of the assault, crossed the river into Oregon the next day, beyond the jurisdiction of the authorities of Walla Walla, which was in Washington Territory. From thence he went to Lewiston and joined Plummer. With Cherokee Bob and Ridgely being out of the way, Charlie Harper, with next in rank on the scale of villainous preferment, became the Walla Walla chief. Intelligence of the discovery of extensive placers on the headwaters of Salmon River, excelling in richness any former locations, had been circulated through all the border towns during the winter. The excitement consequent thereon was intense. Such was the impatience of the people to effect an early arrival there that many left Walla Walla and Lewiston in midwinter, and on their way thither perished in the snows which engorged the mountain passes. Others, more cautious, awaited the coming of warm weather, and made the journey tedious, difficult, and dangerous at best, with comparative safety. Among the latter number were Charlie Harper and his band of brigands, mounted on strong fleet horses which they had acquired during the winter. The criminal cavalcade, with its chief at the head, dashed up the river valley, insulting, threatening, or robbing everyone so unfortunate as to fall in their way. Of the number prominent in the riotous column were Peoples, English, Scott, and Brocky, men whose deeds of villainy have blackened the criminal records of nearly all the larger cities of the Pacific Slope. 
with none of the magnanimity which characterized Joaquin Murrieta and the earlier brigands of California, and with all their recklessness of crime and murder, a meaner, baser, more contemptible band of ruffians perhaps never before disgraced the annals of the race. No crime was too atrocious for them to commit. No act of shame or wantonness was uncongenial to their groveling natures. They were as totally depraved as a long and unchecked career of every variety of criminal indulgence could make them. Afraid of nothing but the law, and not afraid of that in these new and unorganized communities, they were little else than devils incarnate. Insensible to all appeals for mercy, and ever acting upon the cautious maxim that dead men tell no tales, the only chance for escape from death for those whom they assaulted was in their utter inability to do them injury. Human life, regarded as an obstacle to their designs, was of no more importance than the blowing up of a safe, or any other act which stood between them and their prey. Of course, it was impossible that such a band of desperados should pass over the long and desolate route from Walla Walla to Florence without adventure. On the second or third day after leaving Walla Walla, when nearing Florence, they met a company consisting of five men and a boy of sixteen, who were on their way to a neighboring camp. The brigands surrounded them and, with cocked pistols well aimed, gave the usual order to throw up their hands. This order being obeyed, two of them dismounted to search the persons of their victims for treasure, the others meanwhile covering them with their revolvers. Five purses containing amounts varying from fifty to five hundred dollars were taken from them. The boy was overlooked and had seated himself on a granite boulder by the roadside. Scott, as he tells the story himself, approached him for more curiosity than expectation when the following conversation ensued. Come, said Scott, addressing him, draw your weasel now. How do you know I've got any stranger? queried the youth. No fooling, I say, hand out your buckskin. You wouldn't rob a poor little devil like me, would you? Don't keep me waiting any longer, or I'll cut your ears off. And Scott drew his bowie knife as if to carry the threat into execution. Well, I only get half wages, you know. Is your heart all a gizzard? Get off from that stone and shell out or I'll blow your brains off in a minute, said Scott. The boy sprang up hurriedly and with affected reluctance thrust his hand into his pocket. Well, stranger, he inquired with a peculiar, drawn, quizzical expression of the eyes. What do you take salmon river dust at, anyhow? With this, he drew forth an empty purse and handing it to Scott, said, If you think I've got any more, search me. Pleased with the pluck and humor of the lad, one of the band threw him a five-dollar piece, and they galloped furiously on towards Florence. Thundering into the town, they drew up before the first saloon, fired their pistols, and urged their horses into the establishment. Without dismounting, they ordered liquor for the crowd. All the bystanders partook with them. Harper ostentatiously threw one of the purses he had just seized upon the counter, telling the barkeeper to weigh out the amount of the bill, and after a few moments they left the saloon to see, as one of them expressed himself, whether the town was big enough to hold them. This eruption into Florence occurred while that city was comparatively in embryo. The great floods of immigration from the east and west had not yet arrived. Some months must elapse before the expectations of the robbers could be realized. Meantime, they distributed themselves among the saloons and bagnios, and by means of gambling and frequent robberies, contrived to hold the community in fear and pick up a subsistence until the great crowd came. Leaving them for a season, we will now return to Cherokee Bob, whom we left in his ignominious flight from Walla Walla to Lewiston on a stolen horse. He had now established himself in a saloon at Lewiston, and while there renewed an acquaintance with an old pal known as Bill Mayfield. Mayfield was a fugitive from justice from Carson City, Nevada, where in the winter of 1861 and 62, he renewed an acquaintance with Henry Plummer, whom he had known before that time in California. The governor had issued a requisition for the surrender of Plummer, and a warrant for his arrest was in the hands of John Blackburn, the sheriff at Carson City. Though efficient as an officer, Blackburn, while in liquor, was overbearing and boastful of his prowess. His reputation was bad among the leading citizens of the town. 
Foiled in his search for Plummer, who he believed was in the territory, and knowing of Mayfield's intimacy with him, he accused the latter with concealing him. Mayfield denied the charge, and to avoid a quarrel with Blackburn, who was intoxicated, immediately left the saloon where the interview occurred, but as a measure of precaution armed himself with a bowie knife. Blackburn, rendered desperate by liquor, soon followed in pursuit of him and at a later hour of the same day found him in another saloon. As he entered the front, Mayfield tried to leave by the rear door. Failing in this, he drew his knife and concealed it in his sleeve. Approaching Mayfield in a bullying manner, Blackburn said to him, I will arrest Plummer and no one can prevent it. I can arrest anybody. I can arrest you if I wish to. You can arrest me, replied Mayfield, if you have a warrant for my arrest, but you can't without. I tell you, rejoined Blackburn tauntingly, that I can arrest you or anyone else, and added with an oath, I will arrest you anyhow, accompanying this threat with a grasp for his pistol. Mayfield, with flashlight quickness, slipped his knife from its place of concealment and gave him an anticipatory stab in the breast. Blackburn then tried to close with him and being much the stronger man, would have killed him had not Mayfield jumped to the side and plied his knife vigorously until Blackburn fell. He died almost instantly. Mayfield surrendered himself for trial, was convicted of murder and sentenced to be hanged. While awaiting execution in the penitentiary two miles distant from Carson, a plan for undermining the prison was successful, and he escaped. The friends who effected this escape were among the best citizens of Carson City. They deemed the sentence unjust, and as soon as he was out of confinement, mounted him on a good horse, provided him with arms, and bade him leave the state as rapidly as possible. When his escape was discovered the next morning, the jailer started in pursuit. He struck the track of the fugitive and by means of relays gained rapidly upon him. Mayfield's friends, meantime, were not idle. They managed to be appraised of his progress, followed close upon his pursuers, and by a shortcut at a favorable point overtook him and doubling back concealed him at a ranch in Peavine Valley, only 40 miles from Carson City, where he remained for six weeks. Many of the leading citizens of Carson, meantime, watching for an opportunity to aid his escape from the state. A careless explosion of his person led to his recognition and the discovery of his retreat. His friends were the first to learn of it, and before the officers could arrive at the ranch, Mayfield was on his way to Huffaker's Ranch on the Truckee River, which was nearer Carson by half the distance than the ranch he had left. While the officers were scouring the country in pursuit of him, he remained there until spring, sharing a box stall with a favorite racehorse. When spring was far enough advanced to afford pasturage and comfortable travel, he was furnished by his friends with a good outfit and made the journey unmolested to Lewiston, where he joined his old friends Plummer and Cherokee Bob. Here he trumped up an intimacy with a woman calling herself Cynthia, at that time stewardess of a hotel in Lewiston, and the fallen wife of a very worthy man. In June, Cherokee Bob, accompanied by Mayfield and Cynthia, left Lewiston for Florence. Soon after their arrival, the jealousy of Mayfield was aroused by the particular attentions of Bob to his mistress. On his part, Bob made no concealment of his attachment for the woman, and when charged with harboring an intention of appropriating her affections, boldly acknowledged the soft impeachment. Cynthia possessed many charms of person and considerable intelligence. She had, moreover, an eye to the main chance, and was ready to bestow her favors where they would command the most money. Bob was richer than Mayfield, and this fact won for him many encouraging smiles from the fair object of his pursuit. Mayfield's jealousy flamed into anger, and he resolved to bring matters to a crisis, which should either secure his undisturbed possession of the woman, or transfer her to the sole care of his rival. He had confidence enough in Cynthia to believe that when required to choose between him and Cherokee Bob, her good taste, if nothing else, would give him the preference. He had not calculated on the strength of her cupidity. Confronting Bob in her presence, he said as he laid his hand on the butt of his revolver, Bob, you know me. Yes, replied Bob with a similar gesture, and Bill, you know me. Well now, Bob, the question is whether we shall make fools of ourselves or not. Just as you say, Bill, I'm always ready for anything that turns up. 
Bob, if that woman loves you more than me, said Mayfield, take her. I don't want her. But if she thinks the most of me, no person ought to come between us. I call that on the square. Well, I do think considerable of Cynthia, and you are not married to her, you know, replied Bob. That makes no difference. If she loves me and wishes to live with me, no one shall interfere to prevent it. Well, what do you propose to do about it? asked Bob after a brief pause. Let the woman decide for herself, replied Mayfield. What say you, Cynthia, is it Bob or me? Thus appealed to, greatly to the surprise of Mayfield, Cynthia replied, Well, William, Robert is settled in his business now, and don't you think he is better able to take care of me than you are? This reply convinced Mayfield that his influence over the woman was lost. The quarrel terminated in a graceful surrender to Bob of all his claim upon her. You fall heir, said he to his successor, to all the traps and things there are around here. Cherokee Bob insisted upon paying for them, and Cynthia, true to the course of life she was pursuing, tried to soften the pangs of separation from her old lover by reiterating the question if he did not think it the best thing that could be done under the circumstances. Cherokee Bob forced a generous purse upon Mayfield, who left him with a parting injunction to take good care of the girl. The woman shed some tears, and, as we shall see at a later stage of this history, showed by her return to Mayfield that she entertained a real affection, and when a year later she heard of his violent death, was heard to say that she would kill his murderer whenever an opportunity afforded. An explanation of the circumstances under which Bob became settled in his business is not the least interesting part of this narrative. The senior proprietor of the leading saloon in Orofino died a few days before Bob's arrival. He was indebted to Bob for borrowed money. Calling upon the surviving partner soon after his arrival, Bob informed him of the indebtedness and declared his intention of appropriating the saloon and its contents in payment. How much, inquired the man, did you lend my partner? I'll settle with you and pay liberal interest. That's not the idea, rejoined Bob. Do you think me fool enough to lend a fellow $500, and then, after it increases to 5000 square the account with a return of what I lent and a little more? That's not my way of doing biz. How much stock have you got here on hand? Bob carefully committed to writing the invoice verbally furnished. Now, said he, putting the memorandum in his pocket, I will hold you responsible for all these traps, the whole outfit. You've got to close up and get out of this without any delay. I'll give you 24 hours to do it in. You must then deliver everything safe into my hands. The unfortunate saloon keeper knew that the law as administered in that mountain town would afford him no redress. He also knew that to refuse compliance with the demand of Cherokee Bob, however unjust, would precipitate a quarrel which would probably cost him his life. So when Bob, accompanied by two or three Confederates, came the next morning to the saloon to take possession, he was prepared to submit to the imposition without resistance. Walking within the bar, Cherokee Bob emptied the money drawer and gave the contents to his victim. He then invited his friends to drink to the success of the new outfit, and finding himself in undisturbed occupancy, increased the amount of his gift to the man he had expelled to several hundred dollars. This was the manner in which he became, as Cynthia said, settled in business. Florence was now the established headquarters for the robbers. Its isolated location, its distance from the seat of government, its mountain surroundings, and, more than all, its utter destitution of power to enforce law and order, gave it peculiar fitness as a base to the criminal and bloody operations of the desperate gang which infested it. At all hours of the day and night, some of them were to be seen at the two saloons kept by Cherokee Bob and Cyrus Skinner. When one company disappeared, another took its place, and at no time were there less than 20 or 30 of these desperados at one or both of their haunts, plotting and contriving deeds of plunder and robbery, which involved the hard earnings and possibly the lives of many of the fortunate miners of the vicinity. The crowd from both east and west had arrived. The town was full of gold hunters. Expectation lighted up the countenance of every newcomer. Few had yet realized the utter despair of failure in a mining camp. 
In the presence of vice in all its forms, men who were staid and exemplary at home laid aside their morality like a useless garment and yielded to the seductive influences spread for their ruin. The gambling shops and hurdy-gurdy saloons, beheld for the first time by many of these fortune seekers, lured them on step by step until many of them abandoned all thought of the object they had in pursuit for lives of shameful and criminal indulgence. The condition of society thus produced was fatal to all attempts at organization, either for protection or good order. Wholly unrestrained by fear or conscience, the robbers carried on their operations in the full blaze of midday. Affrays were of daily occurrence, and robberies took place in the public streets. Harper, the acknowledged chief, stained with the darkest crimes, walked the streets with the boldness and confidence of one who gloried in his iniquity. Peaceable, honest, well-meaning citizens, completely overawed, were fortunate to escape insult or abuse, as they passed to and fro in pursuit of their occupations. Woe to the unfortunate miner who entered the town if it was known or believed that there was any treasure on his person. If not robbed on the spot, or lured into a hurdy-gurdy saloon, or cheated at a gambling table, he was waylaid by disguised ruffians on his return to his camp, and by threats and violence, or when these failed by death itself, relieved of his hard-bought earnings. For one of these sufferers to recognize and expose any of his assailants was simply to ensure his death at the first convenient opportunity. One of these side exploits was marked by features of peculiar atrocity. An aged, eccentric German miner, who lived alone in a little cabin three miles from town, was supposed to have a considerable amount of gold dust concealed in his dwelling. One morning early in August, a neighbor discovered that the house had been violently entered. The door was broken and scattered in pieces. Entering, he beheld the mangled corpse of the old man, lying amid a general wreck of bedding, boxes, and trunks. The remains of a recent fire in a corner bore evidence of the failure of the design of the robbers to conceal their crime by a general conflagration. The miners were exasperated at an act of such wanton and unprovoked barbarity. A coroner's jury was summoned, and such an inquest held as men in fear of their lives dared to venture. The verdict, as might have been anticipated, was murdered by some person or persons unknown. Here the affair has rested ever since. Acts of violence and bloodshed were not unfrequent among the robbers themselves. Soon after the murder of the German, a company of them, who had been gambling all night in one of the saloons, broke up in a quarrel at sunrise. Before they reached the street, a revolver in the hands of Brocky was discharged, killing instantly one of the departing brawlers. The murderer surrendered himself to a justice of the peace, and escaped upon the singular plea that the shot was accidental, and did not hit the person he intended to kill. One of the jury, in a letter to a friend, wrote, The verdict gave universal satisfaction, the feeling over the homicide among good citizens being that Brocky had done a good thing. If he had killed two of the ruffians instead of one, and then hung himself, good men would have been better pleased. Hickey, the intended victim, was one of the worst men in the band. The year following this occurrence, in a fit of anger induced by intoxication, at a store in Placerville he made a desperate assault upon a peaceful, inoffensive individual who was known by the name of Snapping Andy. Hurriedly snatching a pick handle from a barrel, Andy, by two or three well-directed blows, brought Hickey's career of crime and infamy to a bloody close. For some reason, probably to place him beyond the reach of the friends of the murdered robber, Brocky was assigned to a new position, ostensibly to establish a ferry at the mouth of White Bird Creek, a few miles from town, but really for the purpose of furnishing a convenient rendezvous for his companions, he took up his abode there. It was on the line of travel between Florence and a gold discovery reputed to have been made on a tributary of the Boise River. About the middle of September, Arthur Chapman, son of the Survey General of Oregon, while waiting for ferriage, was brutally assaulted by Brocky, who rushed towards him with pistol and knife, swearing that he would shoot him as full of holes as a sieve, and then cut him into sausage meat. 
With an axe which he seized upon the instant, Chapman clove his skull to the chin. Brocky fell dead in his tracks, another witness to the fulfillment of that terrible denunciation. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Chapman was honorably acquitted of crime. It will not be deemed out of place to record here the desperate fortune of one Matt Bledsoe, who became notorious as an independent freebooter and killed several persons in the valley of the Upper Sacramento and Upper Williamette. His bloody character preceded his arrival at Florence in the fall of 1861. He acknowledged no allegiance to any band and avowed as a ruling principle that he would as soon kill a man as eat his breakfast. While engaged in a game of cards with a miner at a ranch on Whitebird Creek in October of 1861, he provoked an altercation, but the miner being armed, he did not, as usual with him, follow it up by an attack. The next morning, while the miner was going to the creek, he shot and killed him. Mounting his horse, he rode rapidly to Walla Walla, surrendered to the authorities, asked for a trial, and on his own statement that he had killed a man in self-defense, was acquitted. A leap forward in his history to 12 o'clock of a cold winter night of 1865 finds this same villain, Matt Bledsoe, in company with another, each with a courtesan beside him, seated at a table in an oyster saloon in Portland. Some angry words between the women soon involve the men in a quarrel, which Bledsoe brought to a speedy termination by a fatal blow upon the head of his antagonist. He was immediately arrested, tried, convicted of manslaughter, and sentenced to the penitentiary for a long term of years. During the following fall, he escaped, was rearrested, and after trial, returned to prison to serve out a prolonged sentence. Perhaps in the early history of no part of our country were greater difficulties overcome in moving from one place to another than in the mining districts of Oregon and Idaho, essentially a mountain region and in all portions of it away from the narrow valleys formed by the streams filled with the remains of extensive volcanic action, its surface besides being broken into deep canyons, lofty ridges, inaccessible precipices, impassable streams, and impenetrable lava beds was also covered everywhere with the sharp points and fissured hummocks which were cast out during a long and active period of primeval eruption. There were no natural roads in any direction. The trail of the Indian was full of obstacles, often indirect and generally impracticable. To travel with vehicles of any sort was absolutely impossible. The pack animal was the only available resource for transportation. The miner would bind all his earthly gear on the back of a mule or a burrow and grapple with obstructions as they appeared, cutting his way through forests almost interminable and exposing himself to dangers as trying to his fortitude as to his ingenuity. The merchant who wished to transport goods, the saloon keeper who had liquors and billiard tables, the hotel keeper whose furniture was necessary, all had to employ pack animals as the only means of transportation from the towns on the Columbia to the mining camps of the interior. The owner of a train of pack animals was always certain of profitable employment. His life was precarious, his subsistence poor, his responsibilities enormous. He threaded the most dangerous passes and incurred the most fearful risks, for all which he received adequate compensation. The pack train was always a lively feature in the gigantic mountain scenery of Oregon and Idaho. A train of 50 or 100 animals, about equally composed of mules and burros, each heavily laden, the experienced animal in the lead, picking the way for those in the rear. Amid the rocks, escarpments, and precipices of a lofty mountainside was a spectacle of thrilling interest. At times, the least misstep would have precipitated some unfortunate animal, thousands of feet down the steep declivity, dashing him to pieces on the rocks below. Fortunately, the cautious and sure tread of these faithful creatures rendered such an accident a very rare occurrence, though to the person who beheld them in motion for the first time, the feeling was ever present that they could not escape it. The arrival of one of these large trains in a mining camp produced greater excitement among the inhabitants than any other event, and the calculations upon their departure from the Columbia River and their appearance in the interior towns were made and anticipated with nearly as much certainty as if they were governed by a published timetable. 
The confidence of the owner of a train of pack animals and their sagacity and sure-footedness relieved him of all fear of accident by travel, but he could never feel as well assured against the attacks of robbers. All the men in charge of a train were well-armed and in momentary expectation of a surprise. Frequently on the return trips, they were entrusted by merchants with large amounts of gold dust. Opportunities of this character seldom escape the vigilance of the robbers, and and any defect in the police of the departing train ensured an attack upon it in some of the difficult passes on its route to the river. The packer of a train belonging to Neil McClinchy, a well-known mercantile operator of the Upper Columbia River, in October of 1862, when four days out from Florence on his return to Walla Walla, was stopped by a masked party of which Harper was supposed to be the leader, and for want of sufficient force robbed of 14 pounds of gold. As he gave the treasure into the hands of the assailants, the villain who took it said in a consoling tone, That's sensible. If every man was as reasonable as you, things would go along much smoother. Shortly after this robbery, Joseph and John Barry were returning to the river with their train. They had gone but 40 miles from Florence, when they were confronted by three men in masks, who, with leveled pistols, commanded them to throw up their hands. Seeing that resistance was useless, they obeyed, and were relieved of $1,100. The packers recognized the voices of David English and William Peoples, and the third one was afterwards ascertained to be Nelson Scott. The victims returned with all possible expedition to Lewiston, where the report of their loss excited the most intense indignation. As soon as the Berries were assured of the identity of the villains who had robbed them, they appealed to the people to assist them in their capture. The robbers had stripped them of all their hard earnings, and they had the sympathy of every honest man in the community. Nothing was more needed to kindle into a flame of popular excitement the long pent-up fires of smothered indignation. Public sentiment was clamorous for the capture and punishment of the robbers. It gathered strength day by day until it became the all-absorbing topic everywhere. Men assembled on the street corners, in the stores, in the saloons, and at the outside mining camps to compare views and consult upon measures of relief. Meantime, several parties whose faith in immediate action was stronger than in consultation set out in pursuit of the robbers. From the fact that they had passed south of Lewiston, it was believed they had gone down the Columbia River. Distributing themselves along the different roads and trails in that direction, the pursuers made diligent search for them in every nook and corner which could afford them a hiding place. Their diligence was successful. The robbers had separated but were arrested in detail. Peoples at Walla Walla, Scott on Dry Creek near there, and English at Wallula, 40 miles distant on the Columbia River. The only surprise they manifested upon being arrested was at the temerity of their captors. In a community which had so long held them in fear, any legal interference with their business was deemed by them an outrage. They did not pause to inquire whether their reign was near its termination, nor think that perhaps the people had decided as between longer submission to their villainies and condign punishment for their actual crimes. If they had, their efforts to escape would have been immediate. As it was, they rested easy, and reflected savagely upon the revenge in store for their captors, after their friends had effected their rescue. They were taken in irons to Walla Walla. Judge Smith ordered their removal to Florence for trial. Such was the indignation of the citizens of Lewiston that on their arrival there, it was determined that they should be tried by the people. All confidence in the law and the courts was now lost. Accordingly, a committee was appointed to investigate the circumstances of the robbery and declare the punishment. The prisoners were taken in charge by the committee and confined in an unfinished building on the bank of the Clearwater, which was strongly guarded. To make their work thorough and terrify others of the band who were known to be prowling about the saloons of Lewiston, a number of persons were appointed with instructions to effect their immediate arrest. In anticipation of this course, all suspected persons except one escaped by flight. This one, known by the name of Happy Harry, was a simple fellow who denied all association with the band, confessed to a few petty offenses, and was discharged on condition that he would instantly leave and never return to the country. He has never been heard of since. 
One of the shrewdest of the gang, who from a personal deformity was called Clubfoot George, well known as a robber and a horse thief, escaped arrest by surrendering himself to the commandant at Fort Lopwai, a United States post 12 miles distant, who confined him in the guardhouse. The final disposition of the three villains in custody was delayed until the next day. A strong guard of well-armed men surrounded their prison. Just after midnight, the sleeping inhabitants of the town were roused by several shots fired in the direction of the place of confinement. In a few minutes, the streets were filled with citizens. A former friend of People's, one Marshall, who kept a hotel in town, had, in attempting his rescue, fired upon the guard. In return, he received a shot in his arm and was prostrated by a blow from a clubbed musket. The cause of the melee being explained, the people withdrew, leaving the sentinels at their posts. The next morning, at an early hour, the people gathered around the prison. The guards were gone and the door ajar. Unable to restrain their curiosity and fearful that the robbers had been rescued, they pushed the door wide open. There, hanging by the neck, stark and cold, they beheld the bodies of the three desperados. Justice had been anticipated, and the first vigilance committee of the northern mines had commenced its work. No one knew or cared who had done it, but all felt that it was right, and the community breathed freer than at any former period of its history. Intelligence of the execution, with the usual exaggeration, spread far and wide through the mining camps. It was received with approval by the sober citizens, but filled the robber horde with consternation. Charlie Harper, while on his way from Florence to Lewiston to gather full particulars, met a mountaineer. Stranger, he inquired, what's the news? I suppose you've heard about the hanging of them fellers. Heard something, what's the particulars? Well, Bill Peoples, Dave English, and Nell Scott have gone in. They strung them up like dried salmon. Happy Harry got out of the way in time. But if they get Clubfoot George, his life won't be worth a cent. They're after a lot more of them up in Florence. Do you know who all they're after? asked Harper. Yes, Charlie Harper's the big chief they're aching for most, but the story now is that he's already hung. A fellow went down into town before yesterday and said he saw him strung up out here on Camas Prairie. Did you hear anything of it back on the road? Harper needed no further information. He felt that the country was too hot to hold him and that the bloodhounds were on his track. As soon as the miner was out of sight, he turned to the right, crossed the Clearwater River some miles above Lewiston, and pursued a trail to Colville on the Upper Columbia, where we will take leave of him for the present. So that's it for this episode. Here the citizens form the first vigilance committee in these northwest mining towns that were being plagued by Plummer's gang and became a law unto themselves. This is episode two in my series based on this book, Vigilante Days and Ways by Nathaniel Pitt Langford. Plummer does not appear to have been directly involved in the robbing of the berries that led to the hanging deaths of three of the robbers, and Charlie Harper escaped for the time being. In the next episode in this series, we'll hear about more crimes committed by Plummer's gang, and more punishment meted out by the vigilantes. This channel is called Unworthy History because we cover actual history that is now unworthy of history channels on TV. Those channels, unfortunately, don't cover actual history very much anymore. Stay tuned to this channel for more actual history directly from old books written by men and women whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.